Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm very excited to welcome to the podcast today, Nick Rukraut, to talk about horror movies on this very special bonus features edition of the podcast, talking about horror films all the way back to the 1970s to today. We're going to be picking one favorite horror film from each decade of the last five decades. How are we doing, Nick? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about this genre, which is so vast. And we'll talk about all the in, in centricities of this genre. <laughs> it's crazy. Yes. Is this your favorite movie genre? I would say so. Yeah. I think there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to love and hate, which <laughs> yeah. I think is, yeah, just so polarizing among mm -hmm friends, family, anyone you talk to. So I'm excited. Yeah, this is my favorite movie genre. I feel like it's the kind of genre where you really can't go wrong. If it's really, really great and scary, fantastic. If it's not a very good movie, it's usually funny and still very entertaining. <laughs> so, right. You, know. you, you can have different mindsets. You can, you know, go into it saying, I don't care what I'm watching, you know, put yeah. anything on or you can watch something more awards worthy and still enjoy that too. So there's a lot to be had here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've been in love with this genre since I was a little kid. My dad got me into horror films when I was like eight, nine, 10 years old. <laughs> I, by the age of 10, I had seen a lot of the big ones. Uh, one of my earliest memories of watching horror film was watching The Evil Dead. I was nine and it was so <laughs> disgusting, so gruesome that halfway through the movie, I left, I threw up, I came back, finished the movie. Oh my God. And it's one of my favorites to this day. <laughs> but I that mean- sounds deeply traumatizing. The evil, dead, the evil Dead at nine, right? That's pretty intense. I don't know what my dad was thinking. Um, that is. But then that same year, I asked my mom if I could rent Psycho and she looked at the VHS and was like, Brian, it says it's rated R. So no. not. I'm like, mom, I watched The Evil Dead a few months ago. <laughs> What was that rated? The Evil Dead. The Evil Dead, was it unrated? <laughs> like, was, does that movie have an R rating? I mean, that movie I is extremely know. gruesome, right? Uh, I would, I would say it's like unrated. It might have an R rated version. But okay. what's weird about Psycho is that obviously it came out in 1960 before the MPAA, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, started in '68. But I guess later on they rated it because, like, they rated the birds PG-13, and that came out in '63. Right. So for some reason, it said on the VHS, rated R, and my mom was like, no. I'm like, something tells me Psycho will be a little bit easier to take than The Evil Dead, but okay. <laughs> so I had to see it later. <laughs> but uh, where, you know, where does your love of horror movies come from? Do you remember? Did you have any kind of influence when you were younger or just started watching them? Or I'm sure I must have, but I think I just love how the genre can, has gone in so many different directions. Maybe I can think about, I feel like the first movie I ever saw was The Terminator, which almost okay. hits on <laughs> horror in a way. Yeah. But I was born the weekend that movie came out. Oh, wow. Very... <laughs> so my, it's my okay. first, the first movie of, of my life. <laughs> so The Terminator, not that I saw it on my first day. That would have been weird. But... <laughs> I will say, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say this, but Silence of the Lambs was my, the best picture winner of the year I came that I was born. So, okay. Um, and I only saw that recently. So I'm a little oh, okay. behind on some of my horror viewings. I, uh, when I was in high school, I would have friends come over and sometimes we would watch horror films. And the one that everyone stage is completely focused, no chit chat, no anything. Silence of the Lambs. That one kept everyone on edge. Uh, the whole time. I'll never forget that. I had a room of like 10 people and they were just like completely transfixed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's horrifying to this day. So yeah. And amazing and, character work there. And we're both super, you know, super big Oscar buffs. And, you know, mm -hmm. I always think back on sounds of the lambs year. It's so crazy. That came out Valentine's day weekend, 91. Right. Okay. And then it, and then it won the five major awards. More than a year later, right? Because in the 90s, wasn't the Oscars in like March, April? It was later, you know? So it, it might like have been more yeah. than a year later. That's crazy. So I guess that must have been a year where the VHSs took off, right? Like later in the year okay. and just people were watching it. I don't know. Because that's a long time. Usually the Oscar yeah, that movie is. 
is like, you know, released, you know, October to December. So. Yeah. Especially now you have your, I know get out came out like in March, I think yeah, February, March. So yeah, that February was, of, uh, that was a big one. Wow. Yeah. But that almost never happened. So apparently it's just horror films where th those right. stick around. Those stick around. The lucky ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, sadly, for the most part, horror films are not really recognized at the Oscars very much. Sounds of the Lambs uh, was definitely an exception, right? So we yeah. had the year before Kathy, B Kathy Bates won for Misery for Best Actress um, and then Get Out won Best Original Screenplay. So it happens, but it's pretty rare, right? We don't, they don't they're not really taken seriously as often as they should. Yeah, The Exorcist yeah. was nominated. There yes. are only like mm -hmm. six that have ever been nominated for Best Picture, so... Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, going back many, many decades, you don't see too many. And some of them, I think, and which, which we'll talk about on the, on the episode now, I think uh, you mm -hmm. know, some of them were worthy at least of a nomination. Um, right. So let's go back to the 1970s. Uh, the podcast uh, film at 50 is all about films from 50 years ago. So uh, kind of launching the podcast now, we're looking at films of 1970. So I thought it'd be fun to kind of go through the last five decades and pick a favorite horror film from each decade. And then if you have any runners up, feel free to share them. I picked, okay. I picked two for each decade because it's like, it's hard to just, just say, just talk it's about very one, hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's kind of tricky. It's right. Like, do you just, you pick the best one? Do you pick your favorite? I just kind of picked the, my favorites. They're not necessarily the greatest movies of all time, but they're films that okay. mean something to me. And, you know, right. and there's not going to be any like huge surprises here. I'm not revealing like a title that, you know, half of our audience is like, what <laughs> is that about? Like, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you. Do you are you going to reveal something that I'm like, what is that about? Is that? You know, no, so definitely not. No. <laughs> um, I think these are all on like top horror lists, top movie lists okay. of the decades of the century of, of everything. So it won't be new, but I think that makes them even more exciting and, mm -hmm. you know, prominent in their decade that we yeah. need to talk about them. Yeah, and I've always thought, you know, if, if I had to pick a favorite decade of horror, it'd probably be the 70s. I love that decade. There's such like a grittiness to the films there. And now that we have the MPAA, filmmakers are free to do whatever they'd like. And this is before like the studio system takes over in like the 80s and 90s. And, you know, there's, there's so much kind of freedom in this decade. So, um, you know, everyone's trying to find their voice as horror filmmakers and you know this, this is the decade of uh, you know George Romero and Wes Craven and John Carpenter mm -hmm. and um, so many important influential filmmakers um, so what, uh, you can reveal your uh, your top favorite or if you have any runners up the 1970s what are we like in the horror realm in the 70s so I've only seen a lot of these recently which is maybe disappointing <laughs> but um, I, I did make a list of like by the decade films that came out and kind of figuring out what was my favorite. Okay. My, my winner, I feel like we need a drum roll, drum, drum roll, drum roll <laughs> <laughs> is Halloween. It quintessential in horror and there's just so much to love from this movie. The score especially I think is maybe mm -hmm. one of the best in any horror movie ever made maybe the best <laughs> it's I, just I, like iconic it's so great. i think we could call it that yeah <laughs> it even more than you know i watched the exorcist which also came out this decade and yep. also has a great score or a theme i would call it because it doesn't there's not much music in the film so i'm not sure i can call it a score but yeah. it's a great theme but that i think theme Hall is fantastic yeah but i think halloween runs deeper and really frightens you along with everything else that's happening with the mask and Jamie Lee Curtis's performance and it's everything so iconic. I mean, just, the, just the fact that they were like, you know, super low budget. They're like, okay, what are we going to use as a mask? Uh, let's go, let's go look at the <laughs> costume store. What about this William Shatner well, Star Shatner. Trek? Oh yeah. Okay. Let's just <laughs> cut open the eyes spray paint it white we're good yeah like i feel like you know <laughs> 99 out of 100 times that would have been a complete disaster right and for some reason right. it just works it works like the, the the cinematography by dean cundy the way the film is shot uh, there's such a commanding presence of michael myers in that movie and the mask i think i think i read or i saw in an interview like uh, it was between that and a clown mask and i don't think the clown mask would have had staying power right i think not at all we get it later on and that's not 
near the power yeah. of Halloween. So, yeah, yeah. So my favorite film, my favorite horror film of the decade, is Halloween as well. And okay, uh, it's, my, it's my favorite horror film of all time. And part of it is because of when I saw it, I was ten years old. I was still kind of like getting into horror films. And I still to this day remember watching it late at night by myself, Halloween night, I think it was 95. Um, and it was so terrifying. I turned it off, went to bed. I'm pretty sure I had a nightmare of some kind. Got up and finished the movie in the morning when it, there was light outside. <laughs> you know? like, As it uh, should it was, be watched. It was yeah. too much. That was too much. For some reason, The Evil Dead and some of these other ones, they were fine at 9, 10, 11 years old. But Halloween, that was that was way too much. Like I, I don't think anyone under ten should watch Halloween. It's just too scary, you know. Oh no way! I mean, <laughs> I'm sure it would have an R rating today. And oh yeah, I I, I can't believe you watched these movies when you were that young. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Oh, I was reading Stephen King at nine ten. I did a book report. <laughs> I did a book report of Carrie in the fourth grade and talked about like her menstrual cycle and the teacher pulled me aside and she said, Brian, you can't, you something's can't. not right. <laughs> she said, she said, you got, you can't talk about that in fourth grade. I'm like, Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, like by nine, I was like goosebumps. That's for kids. <laughs> Mom, I want Stephen King, <laughs> you know? So yeah. So I think part of my obsession and love of the genre is that like, I was super into it very, very young, right? So every time mm -hmm. I watch Halloween, and I've, I don't even want to know how many times I've watched it, uh, you know, at least once every October these days, uh, I've just always just transported back to, you know, when I was 9, 10, 11, and just really, you know, so it's kind of like a, the nostalgic aspect for me is yeah. really important. But then beyond that, it's just a really rich and, you know, beautifully crafted film. It's like, that it was made for less than three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I mean, it's pretty insane, right? <laughs> yeah the the handheld work I think really got me. It's yeah. being in that perspective of Michael Myers and seeing him kill these people, and through the opening sequence of you know you see through the eye slits of the mask. I yeah. think that's just adds to the creepiness of what's happening. And there's a scene where the friend is in the laundry room and she has to wash these clothes and he's watching her and there's so much anticipation building of him killing her because you know it's going to happen and eventually it does but you waited so long for that to happen it just builds oh throughout gosh. it's it's so exciting and you just saw it recently right the, like I you, did this is I, something you saw probably like, last month I, I last month okay <laughs> I've done so much homework for you know, my podcast yeah. horror draft. And then this one, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I am exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, can we get to November 1st? There's a lot. <laughs> Santa? I am so ready. I'm so ready for all the new Netflix holiday films that are coming. Like out. you got, you're like, you got one more week <laughs> yeah. and then we, we can get do two, it. We can and do then it. we get two months of Christmas movies, but then you're not going to watch any of the Santa horror films like silent night, deadly night. <laughs> we'll we'll turn Black Christmas Black back Christmas on. Let's do it, <laughs> which you know Black Christmas from seventy four. That's kind of known for you know Halloween. You, you think oh that's the first time we see like a villain's point of view, but actually it was it was done before that. It was done in Black Christmas. It was done in Peeping Tom, which also came out in nineteen sixty. Um, but it's I don't think it had been done quite as well as it is in Halloween. So um, any other yeah. films from that decade that you like? Any horror films from the seventies? Any runners up? Or you mentioned The Exorcist, right? Yeah. So The Exorcist is on my list. Um, there are a few that I haven't. I I don't think I've seen Carrie, and I know this was from this decade, which you you briefly mentioned. I know that's my. I first, really wanted to get to it. Up. Okay. So Carrie. You know, the first, I, you know, it's hard to talk about without giving away everything, but the, like the first 75% of the movie is not really a horror film at all, right? It's like a drama. It's, okay. like, a com it's like a coming of age drama where mm -hmm. there's like some tension, some, you're like, okay, something's kind of not right here. <laughs> you know, her mom played by Piper Laurie is an is mm -hmm. insane religious nut, uh, but it doesn't really turn into a horror film until the last 25% of the movie. Prom um, night and I mean the you know the the bucket of blood is very iconic yeah and i know things that happen so yeah I'm... yeah but it's de yeah it's definitely worth uh seeing if you're into horror films you, you gotta mm -hmm. add carrie to your list it's it's great and it's based on the very first stephen king novel 
Stephen King, man, that guy, I mean, he's gotten, he's obviously a very talented author, one of my favorites, mm -hmm. but he's also gotten very lucky with adaptations, right? I mean, he's, there's been some that aren't so great, but right. um, I have a Stephen King adaptation as a runner up on every decade of the last five decades. Hmm. So I don't think there's any other author who could say that, right? Of any genre, you know, okay. So someone who has, you know, almost every novel he's written has been adapted into a film and um, many of them have turned out really, really well. So the first one, gosh, you know, care, to, for your first book to become a film and have it to be that strong. Uh, yeah, Carrie's yeah, definitely worth it. That's, that's big. And uh, also Oscar nominee, Sissy Spacek uh, was nominated for Best Actress in a leading role for Carrie as Carrie. And then Piper Laurie was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress uh, as her mom, Margaret. And uh, something interesting about Piper Laurie, I don't know if you know this Oscar uh, bit of trivia is that uh, the previous film she made before Carrie was 15 years prior in 1961, she appeared opposite Paul Newman in The Hustler and she got nominated for Best Supporting Actress or might've been Lead Actress uh, for The Hustler, took 15 years off of film acting, came back, wow. did Carrie, got another nomination. <laughs> that's pretty that's, that's pretty rare right <laughs> yeah just it's you know like a terrence malick just uh, just come back every 15 20 years <laughs> another nomination <laughs> yeah she didn't win she never won unfortunately she got one more nomination for uh children of a lesser god in the 80s but um mm. uh, i got to meet her once there was a there was a reno film festival from like 2000 wow. from like 2000 to 2004 like right when i was in high school uh, mm -hmm. And Piper Laurie came and she and they screened Carrie and she did like a 10 minute, like, you know, little introduction to it and did a Q&A and I got to say, hi cool. to her. I got to say hi to her and she said, this is not a horror film. This is a comedy. <laughs> what she said about it. I'm like, well, yeah, it's I mean, you're pretty funny in it, but in a very, you know, terrifying way. Um, away. <laughs> and my other uh, runner up would be the Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974. Have you seen that? I did. I rewatched it last night. Oh, you just I, watched it. Okay. <laughs> I, th I, I had definitely seen it before, but it had been a while. And I think similar to what you talked about with Carrie about mm -hmm. it, you know, the first part of it wasn't really a horror film. I think Texas Chainsaw had so much setup going on yeah. that it took a while to get into. And, and once mm -hmm. it happened, some of its best moments were just, the most terrifying. Yeah. It's definitely not like Carrie. Texas Chainsaw, what is it, 25 minutes maybe in? Like is when it's the first like hit over the head. <laughs> At least. It, I think it was like it 30, 35 that? minutes. 35? Yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, checked on my TV. I was like, oh my God, this is taking so long. Like, They're in this van. Let's get and to a murder. <laughs> they, yeah. They have the guy in the van with them and we, we know he's involved somehow. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get really, really scary. And then he shuts the door closed in the house. Ooh. What I love about that film me. is it feels so much like a documentary. It doesn't really feel like you're watching a fictional movie. <laughs> like it's very it's gritty. Got that, it's got that yeah. gritty documentary feel to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, none of the actors in the film are necessarily people you recognize today. So, right. Um, and that's always, that's always a really scary in a horror film that works is when you, you don't recognize anybody in it. It kind of adds a, you know, a new layer right. to it. As opposed to, I mean, like, it's, oh, it's, it's him. <laughs> it's partly a real story. I I don't know the the links to how true of a story it is, but it's it's loosely based on Ed Gein, I think, from the yeah. Midwest. So yeah, as Psycho is too, right? It's like there's like a couple famous films based on the same right. person, but then they do something different. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. different. <laughs> um, any other films from the '70s? I really love The Hills Have Eyes as well by Wes Craven. Have you seen that one? I haven't seen the original. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely have seen the remake, okay. which I thought was scary. So the remake was pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly, you know, remakes don't, don't do that much for me except for a few. And I think Texas Chainsaw, I can mention too, but Hills yeah. Have Eyes here, which I think were so much a part of forming the future of horror. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. Very important. Absolutely. I would say Alien here. Mm -hmm. is big and then jaws too two like monster films yeah. that jaws t-o-o -O, right not the number <laughs> <laughs> right right you're ja like jaws the first well. jaws the first not... jaws is okay <laughs> the second one oh my god it's, it's so good <laughs> yeah yeah it's funny i never think of jaws as a horror film but it absolutely is 
right? I, I found myself way more scared than I expected <laughs> myself to be from probably I would call it more of a thriller movie, but it yeah. definitely has horror aspects and relating to the quarantine we're in right now is <laughs> it's yeah. unsettling how much the mayor has the mayor oh yeah related so much of what has happened recently so you can go back in the water it's, it's fine watch. there's nothing wrong right <laughs> uh, and you know what jaws is rated is it like pg pg that wow. is one terrifying pg <laughs> rated movie right and I, my For memory of jaws shirt. i went to i want to say it was seven or eight i went to a like a friend seventh oh or eighth uh, yeah so yes I, I mean it was very we were very, <laughs> very young. young uh and my friend put on jaws and it was so terrifying to me that i left the room with all my boy you know friends and went up to his sister's room she was watching some animated disney movie i i watched the disney movie with his little sister not jaws <laughs> i remember you saying this in a previous pod yeah that's that sounds about right. There, there are some terrifying scenes on the boat. Where I mean, the scene of him it being comes out of the up. water. Oh yeah, it's, the two yeah. scene, the scene where the guy comes out, you know, with like the dead, like the dead, you know, the dead guy, and um, mm -hmm. the Richard Dreyfus is like, ah, you know, and then the uh, and then the last scene, right, where Quint's being eaten. I mean, it's like, it's like, how is that PG? Oh my god! Right. You know. And I think knowing that it's a mechanized shark in real life. Yeah. just makes it the more scary because it does look real and what oh, it's doing when it comes up onto the ship and that part that looks Ooh, very real i, I definitely me? jumped yeah that's <laughs> yeah so anyway so that's that's a really important decade for horror i think and then that moves into the 80s which is also a really fun i mean you could spend a lot of years just watching 80s horror films there's so many totally. right so at by 1980 you know we've gotten halloween now we're getting friday the 13th and now filmmakers are recognizing like oh we can make these movies for a very low budget and make mm -hmm. a profit and so you're just seeing just an explosion of horror films we've talked on the pod about how the first few years of the 70s there's not really any horror films it's kind of like a ghost town uh but when you get to the 80s they're just everywhere all over the place sequels there's, and all sorts of stuff right there's so much i mean cronenberg is such a big part of the 80s and i think that forms this gross Yep. but not not so cgi version of all of this horror that we have today and more remakes but it it's more of a b movie vibe than mm -hmm. than not yeah you don't yeah very few like really genuinely terrifying horror films from the 80s they're usually a little bit more campy a little bit more mm -hmm. you know more about the entertainment value than anything else um, cause I mean, I mean, how many Friday 13th movies are there in just the one decade, eight, right? I think there's eight and it's like, <laughs> it's you know, decade, it's wow. like, it's like, it, do, it doesn't even like the first movie isn't really even about Jason. <laughs> and then like the yeah. rest of the series, he's just like this, you, is, know, yeah. mu, mu, you know, mutation. <laughs> like and we monster. get Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. yeah. Which had so many sequels. <laughs> I, I'm proudly displaying my Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Picture. <laughs> just got Fred, Freddy. There he is, Freddy. The only person who can play Freddy, and that is Robert England. <laughs> As we learned, <laughs> I don't know what your take is on the on the remake from 2010, but <laughs> I I didn't see so Crazy. many remakes. I I lost hope in. Did you see the Evil? We can get there, but the Evil Dead remake in the 2010s, I didn't yeah, see th either. That was really good. They're not, okay. you know. I'm not a huge hater of remakes if they do it well. And if enough time has right. passed, um, the one that really just kind of choked my childhood <laughs> to death was the Rob Zombie Halloween remake. I just, I absolutely detested that movie to the point <laughs> where like, I was hard for me to kind of focus on anything else for the first 12 hours after I watched it. But <laughs> I, was like, I went home, I still yeah. have it. I, I went home and I, I was doing, I was blogging film reviews at the time. And I wrote like, 36 paragraphs <laughs> just like the longest oh just the longest review you could ever imagine just all the hate yeah <laughs> it was just like hate spewing on the page it was like <laughs> you know maybe just i got like ruined <laughs> i kind of i've kind of gotten like gone past it now, now the halloween franchise it's so messed up with the timeline now it's like so confusing now we i mean when when uh jamie lee curtis laurie stroh dies in halloween 8 resurrection i was like mm -hmm. 
Well, that's sad. That's the last time she's playing Laurie Strode. She gets to they die. In no. that, she gets to die <laughs> in that no. stupid way where he just like drops her. It's like so dumb. Push out the window, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, She's filmmakers are like, well, we've remade everything in horror. So <laughs> what if we made a Halloween sequel where we just kind of did away with everything but the original? Like, we'll just pretend those don't exist. And it's just a direct sequel to the original. And all of a sudden... She's back. And that was a really great kind of uh, resurgence for her character. And did you see the newest Halloween from 2018? I loved the 2018 Halloween. I thought so she much. deserved I... the Golden Globe nomination for that. Support. She really I did. She was really she, good. She brought it back. I cannot wait for Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends. I'm so excited. We got a trailer early as, earlier this year before it was yeah, a little brief. moved until next year. Yeah, a little teaser. It's kind of weird to think like if without COVID, like we would have seen kills. We would have now. had everything. Would have we, we would have seen so much in the Heights. We would have Dune coming out. There's a lot I don't want to think about that I Wonder can't Woman, see for another yeah. year. Yeah, West Side Story. West Side Story was yeah. coming out in Christmas, pushed back a year. It's like whoa. I mean, it's like all it's it's crazy. Um, but I'm trying to think what other horror films have been pushed back. Candyman. There's a new Candyman that was going to come out. Right. Right. Um, that was probably franchise? the biggest one this year. We've had a few so far this year that I think have been pretty decent. The Invisible Man. Loved we had it. Possessor recently. The Rental. I I love The Invisible Man. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. I just watched it a couple weeks ago. It was so good. <laughs> like I was, I was, you know. I mean, that's an example of how you do a remake, right? I mean, you look Talk back about at the, a good remake. The exactly. 1930s Invisible Man, uh, you know, directed by James Whale. It's a much different kind of film. Um, and, you know, Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon is okay. It's kind of like Invisible Man. But, like, this new one was a really unique and creative take on the material. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, Elizabeth Moss was just so great. I mean, I think she's amazing. Awesome. I think she gave it a, a worthy, you know, awards performance. But it might be too early in the year. People, not enough people may remember it. But. Yeah, too too much of a horror vibe. I mean, her, <laughs> yeah. she had that in Shirley this year, which Shirley. she was oh, I, amazing I, in yeah. both. Yeah, have you seen Shirley? I, it's on my list. I haven't gotten to it yet. I did. I did see it. It's a drier film. Drier. Okay. But um, very quirky in a way. Mm -hmm. But she's amazing in both. For okay. Sure. Cool. Yeah. So going back to the '80s, what's your favorite '80s horror film? If you had to pick one. This was probably the easiest year for oh, it me. Okay. It, it has to be The Shining. Okay. Which again, we can debate about if it's horror or psychological thriller, but a horror film. This is okay, good. <laughs> so it fits. Um, <laughs> no, it's not horror, it's thriller. It's like, <laughs> it's, it, it's terrifying. It's a horror film. <laughs> exactly. You have blood rushing out of the elevator and Jack Torrance and Shelley Duvall, it, her screams. It's just, Every little piece is so well done. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, I just have all these, all these stories about childhood, but I saw the shining in sixth grade <laughs> at a friend's birthday party. Terrifying. Much later. Terrifying. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I was like 12 when I saw the shining. So I'm older now. Now I'm 12. Right. Um, and I'm just, I remember an hour in, I'm like, what are we watching? <laughs> this is too much. <laughs> You know, so it wasn't just me, you know, it's, it was all my friends showing me these horror films. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's one I, every time I revisited, I taught it in a college class a couple years ago. And, you know, it's just, it's so rich, right? There's like, just, just taking it on like a cinematography level, the music, uh, you know, some people criticize Jack Nicholson's performance in that movie. He's, he, he's too crazy too early. Uh, but that's never really bothered me. I think you yeah. kind of, you know, I think at the time, Stephen King, who does not like that film, which is crazy to me, uh, he wanted someone like William Hurt, like someone a little bit hmm. more every man, right? Like, so that you really are taken aback when they go crazy. Um, but Jack Nicholson has enough of that. I don't think he's like crazy Jack in the, in the first 30 minutes. Like, I think he's a, you know, he's a school teacher. He's a, you know, aspiring writer and he's frustrated. And mm -hmm. that all comes through in his performance. And Shelley Duvall, who I've always loved as an actress is just so great in that movie you're just like her, her eyes when she gets scared in the second half and um i i love every scene of that movie and revisiting again last year right before i saw dr sleep uh the okay. semi-sequel with the yeah. mcgregor um i just fell in love with it all over again it's such a great movie and the the book too 
Great I, book. Yeah. Is probably the scariest book I've ever read. Yeah. And Stephen King again came through. I think <laughs> there are some things in the book that they don't include in the movie that are just as horrifying. There's yeah. a scene in the in the garden where these sculptures yeah, kind like of come to life and yeah. start attacking them. Yeah, exactly. But everything in the movie from every singular aspect from the cinematography, the score, mm-hmm. the the introductory scene through the mountains getting to the Overlook Hotel and just the setting itself is puts you in this crazy mindset. And then we, yeah. along the way, the colors, the the characters it you just devolve into this madness with them i feel so lucky that we got to get a stanley kubrick horror film right i mean that's exactly he was a filmmaker who just did all kinds of genres didn't really matter he just if he was you know on board with the story uh the fact that one of his what 12 or 13 films he didn't make very many that the one of them is a horror Mm -hmm. film like this i think i think we're, we're lucky that he got he got around to it, especially since at the end of his career, you know, he's making a movie every seven plus years. Like, you know, he wasn't working fast. So, um, yeah, I just, I, as you said about the book too, the book is very, very different. And so I almost sometimes like that when, when they're both super different, you can kind of appreciate both on their own terms. Uh, and mm-hmm. you can read the, like the, the psychology of Jack is much, goes much deeper in the novel and you can kind of appreciate that there. But then the film is kind of this other thing. It's more of a, stanley kubrick movie than it is a stephen king movie and you can appreciate that too so yeah i think both are fantastic yeah so any other uh what are your other favorite horror films from the 80s i don't have a ton from the 80s okay 80s uh i've I've seen the evil dead i i feel like it's more camp to me (laughs) and you know i i think i saw cabin in the woods before the evil dead so once i saw it okay i said wow this is definitely a play on that and kind Mm -hmm. of playing on the camp of everything um yeah cabin in the woods was fun that was like what 2012 i think um yeah that was 2010s for sure yeah Yeah, so for the 80s what about you for the 80s so my my first runner-up my second favorite of the decade would be the shining my third favorite are yeah my third favorite would be the fly probably the fly by david cronenberg which mm-hmm. you know is 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 it's more than just a horror film right it's like it's like a tragic love story <laughs> kind of science fiction uh, mm-hmm. god that movie gets me every time that's my favorite <laughs> jeff goldblum performance yeah. i loved i love gina davis and she's great in it it's kind of like her first notable role to film is the fly and the makeup job which won an academy award for best makeup is just unbelievable okay. that movie and uh, it's like just gruesome enough <laughs> that it kind of satisfies like the horror geek in you, but it's also mm-hmm. never goes overboard with that. Like it really, you know, focuses on the characters and the story. And the last scene is just so tragic. It always gets me every time I see it. And um, so, yeah, I would put the fly uh, as third, kind of close to evil dead. Evil dead is definitely up there uh, along with poltergeist, uh, which is also a really Another fun classic. one which uh, has been debated forever. Was it directed by Steven Spielberg or Toby Hooper? I don't know. (laughs) It's exactly (laughs) what it feels like. Yeah. It's surprising to, you know, for him to go from Texas Chainsaw to Poltergeist. It does not seem right. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it definitely has got, you know, some of Steven Steven Spielberg's, um, you know, like his sensibilities are, are his in mannerisms yeah, yeah exactly but for and that's another one like jaws that was rated pg right and poltergeist is pretty scary for pg <laughs> like that's yeah not, it's not a movie you would show little kids i think they no. would have nightmares for many weeks um but my favorite if i had to pick a favorite uh you know i'm a huge west craven fan and uh nightmare on elm street 1984 nightmare on elm street <laughs> <Freddy Krueger. laughs> uh, you know i love the series i love most of the sequels and especially Wes Craven's new nightmare from 1994. Okay. Uh, if you're a fan of the series at all, if you're a fan of, uh, of that character, it's, it's such a great film, but nothing really compares to the original. I still think it's one of the scariest movies ever because of this concept, right? It's like, what if, you know, you had you know, a slasher villain, crazy person coming after you while you're asleep, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you can't escape that. I mean, you so we all as human beings, and what's crazy, it, uh, it took him three years, three years, Wes Craven, to convince anyone to, you know, pony up the budget to make the movie. And because they all thought, oh. well, this isn't scary. It's going to be, it's about, 
you know, a, a, you know, a guy coming after teenagers while they're asleep. That's not scary. It's dreams. Who cares? But it does really kind of hit you like this idea of like, what if you had no control over that and someone was trying mm-hmm. to kill you in your dreams? And if you don't wake up, you're dead. You know, it's like, it's a great concept. And, you know, it, it was like low budget enough to where he's not overdoing some of that corny, you know, mid 1980s CG effects and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's got yeah. just enough to like, okay. But uh, a lot of practical effects, great final girl, leading lady, Heather uh, Lane camp and that playing Nancy. She's great in it. And then Robert England, Wes Craven wanted a big burly guy for, for <laughs> Freddie and Robert England stumbled into the audition and it was like, okay, this is not what I expected, but let's go with it. What a great masterstroke. Cause he was perfect for this role. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it plays so much better with someone who is more everyday looking in a way, at yeah. least body type wise. And except for the face, <laughs> the right, stars right. Are... the burn, the burn, the burn, um, but he seeing him running after these characters in this movie is terrifying and you just want to <laughs> yeah. scream for them. Yeah. And I did watch, I watched the trailer. I haven't seen new nightmare, Okay. but I saw that it was like this very meta mm-hmm. performance of Wes is in the film and he's creating this movie yeah. and he's coming back to life through this movie, which is a very Wes Craven thing to do, I feel like. Oh, the the concept's fascinating, right? Because Freddy's Dead, The New Nightmare came out in 91. That ended the series. Freddy Krueger dies at the end. It's over. Uh, and Wes Craven's idea to do one more would be, well, what if af- now that we've killed off Freddy in the films, like his soul, his essence has now been resurrected into the real world. And that version of Freddy is now going after the the cast and crew that were involved in the uh-huh. making of the movie. I mean, that is a fascinating idea. <laughs> uh, the, I think the the only way that got made was that it was Wes Craven who had right. enough you know power in the '90s to do that. So I mean, it's so interesting. It's a really cool horror film. Yeah, <laughs> have you you've seen the original uh, Nightmare, right? I've seen the original. How many sequels were there? So there, there were a number, right? Yeah. So before New Nightmare. Uh, there are six. There's um, okay. Well, I was gonna so, say five or six. Yeah. So there's uh two, three, four, five, six is Freddy's dead, and then New Nightmare is technically seven, and okay. then only only ones after that are Freddy versus Jason from 2003, which is which is a fun one, <laughs> super fun. It is fun. I do like that one. And just the remake and from 2010. It's kind of crazy to think in the last 20 years. I mean, we really haven't gotten a whole lot of. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street content. Same with Friday the 13th. They've been kind of like hibernating. Um, I thought with the release of the new Halloween, I thought, okay, maybe maybe they'll bring back, bring ni- back ni- Nightmare, bit. you know, do like a direct sequel to the original of Nightmare or something. It could be fun, but I haven't heard anything. Well, when did we have the sequel or the, the newest Nightmare? Because that was in the 2010s, right? Didn't no, we get a remake? The remake was 2010. Yeah. Okay. That was, I, I uh, didn't see that. Rooney, Ma- Ro- Rooney Mara is Nancy in that movie. <laughs> okay. And then what the later the same year, she's in the social network. And then a year later, right. she gets a, a nomination for Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. So that was kind of like her, like, her transition to some better parts after the Nightmare remake. Um, but yeah, I, I just think, I, I think if you're a fan of 80s horror, I, I think one of the essential, the iconic films you have to see is, is the Entirely. original Nightmare. Right. So some of the sequels are better than others, but the first one still works really well. Any other films from the 80s that you like? Horror films. You, you know, I saw Child's Play recently. I, that's a fun I'm, one. <laughs> it's fun, but wow, is it just, ooh, I don't know if it holds up. It's Oh, you didn't think it held up? Yeah. Kind of crazy. It's a little cheesy. <laughs> it's very when he's, cheesy. When he's think, walking at the end, <laughs> he looks a little fake. He's yeah. walking the whole time and then he's burned at the very end and his body parts are shattered and he's still alive. It's it's a yeah. lot. Yeah, I um, like Child's Play. I prefer the goofier Bride of Chucky with uh, Jennifer okay. Tilly. That one is probably my favorite of that series. It's so great. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first one's pretty decent. You know, it did, it did well at the time, but the first yeah. two sequels are not great. <laughs> Two and three. Um, which came out in the early 90s, which was not a great time for horror outside of like uh, Misery and, and Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, any other horror films from the 80s? I, I mean, I, I have my list here and I yeah. haven't seen a lot of these 80s ones, but um, The Thing was another big one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one hurt uh, John Carpenter 
who directed Halloween, of course. I, I guess the thing mm -hmm. in 82 didn't do, re didn't do very well at the box office. So that it kind of took him a while to kind of come back from that. Um, okay. which is kind of crazy to think that that movie didn't do well because uh, I think part of it is it came out in the summer of 82 and there were so many kind of iconic films that came out that summer including Poltergeist and E.T. all came out okay. uh, that summer um, it, like if you look at the list of like May to July of 82 it's just like every weekend there's like an iconic film it's like oh my god <laughs> we don't really we don't really get that today you know that's amazing yeah <laughs> especially not today <laughs> yeah exactly waiting waiting yeah. waiting all right, so let's get into the 90s. So what is our favorite horror film of the 90s? Which is not, you know, that decade for horror outside of like a few exceptions of, you know, important it's, film. It's a little chaotic this decade. <laughs> um, trying to try, we're trying to find, you know, the voice of horror in the 90s. Like, what, yeah. what, what do we want to be, you know? So I think what becomes the face of new horror is Scream. And that's my pick for best of the decade. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's... It's meta, it's scary, it's camp, it's fun. And, and it holds getting up. that it's still great. So so well. The, <laughs> honestly, the whole initial trilogy of one, two, three is just so fun. And I even watched Scream Three recently. Mm -hmm. And people people hate on it, but it's yeah. sure it's still fun. You, you know, it's it's part of that world and yeah. it's so fun to be in it. And getting that initial sequence with Drew Barrymore and running and, you know, you yeah. feel for her, you're, you're rooting for her and she gets tackled and ghost face, yeah. I think is such an iconic <laughs> mask yeah. in horror. Mm -hmm. There's just so much to love about it. And their, their twist endings, um, all of the killings in all the films, it's just, it's so much fun. And I, every time I watch, I'm scared. I'm screaming. I, I'm, clutching onto the the couch oh absolutely scream is a very important movie in my life uh i saw that when i was 12 <laughs> in the theater again and the th yeah they're all they're all the my favorites all from like when i'm a kid but that's one of the, one of the last movies i remember seeing where i walked in knowing absolutely nothing all i knew was that wes craven who had made night who had made nightmare that i'd seen had directed mm -hmm. it i didn't know what the story was so when they're doing the movie trivia at the beginning that's like 12 year old terrifying. me's like 12 year old me's like no, the answer is not Jason. <laughs> you idiot. No, it's the mom. You know, I'm in the back of the theater. Uh, but that that opening 15 minutes, however long, I mean, that is still probably the strongest it's... sequence of any screen movie. It's so, you know, intense. And there's nothing funny about, you know, people think a scream is like a comedy. Some people think, oh, it's kind of more funny than scary. But that opening 15 minutes is terrifying. That is not, no, there's <laughs> no funny moment. And... I think Scary Movie has done such a good job yeah. of making it funny that we think you know you that, have yeah. you have the Jiffy Pop you know as big as yeah. a balloon and <laughs> all of these moments from Scream Two also and it's it, it, it's such a good time. I would rewatch these every year. Yeah, are you? Do you like the fourth one? I love the fourth. Oh, okay, one. okay. You said the first three, yeah. so I was like, oh, does that mean you don't like the fourth? Well, one? so. So I, I rewatched three recently oh, okay. and it's framed as this trilogy because yeah. rules of the bring trilogy. in <laughs> exactly. So I think the fourth being this reboot of the genre and what this world is was fresh and exciting. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's a part of the world, but I think of it almost as a different entity in, in the West Craven universe. Yeah. Also yeah, because and, and that's it was... his last film too. The last film yeah. was directed uh, was Scream Four. Yeah. Um, and now I'm I, I'm sure you know that they're in production right now of Scream Five with new yeah. directors. The directors of Ready or Not, which I still have not seen. I need to watch it. It's on my list. <laughs> Ooh, that <laughs> I've it, heard it's really it's good. It's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm excited. I'm like as long as like Sydney, Gale, Dewey, they're not like the opening <laughs> kill. <laughs> as long as a... You know, if they yeah. bring the, Nev Campbell, it, like there were like six months, I was like, "Is she doing? Is she gonna do the fifth one?" Finally, said yes. I'm like, I'm like, if the directors are big, big, big fans of the of the series and want to, you know, pay you know justice to Wes Craven, and they're not gonna kill off Sidney Prescott in the opening ten minutes. They're not gonna do that, right? <laughs> as long as it's not H, you know, Halloween, Halloween resurrection. resurrection. <laughs> let's let's hope not. You know, I don't but, think I don't think Campbell would have signed on if that was the case. I would be surprised. No, and 
I, I haven't listened to it yet, but Jamie Lee Curtis and Nev, Nev Campbell did an interview recently. So good. And I think she talks about, you yeah. know, Scream 5 and if she wanted to do a new version without yeah. Wes. And mm-hmm. I... <sighs> Yeah, she said they wrote them a le- the directors wrote her a letter saying, you know, Scream is the movie that got us please, into please. filmmaking. <laughs> and, you know, we want to do this with you. I yeah, I think I think they're going to pay respect to the cast and to Wes Craven and and make them like a really, you know, three-dimensional characters, you know, big force in the yeah. movie and not just like kill them off in the beginning. The audiences would go nuts. You, they would hate that. You really can't and I don't think they would have signed on. I'm sure they read the script beforehand and there's no way they would have signed on if, you know, no. something wasn't yeah. right. So that's very exciting. I thought, and, I thought they were going to kill uh, Sydney at the end of four when she stabbed yeah. her and she, I'm like, it was close. It was close. I'm like, she and is I, not dying by Emma Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a big like tour story three moment where you're like, wow, yeah. this is happening. This is the end. And they're holding hands it's... about ready to be burned alive. Thank you, uh... Pixar. <laughs> um, so when uh at the end of four, when she act when she does like you know electrocute Emma Roberts and she says yeah. that she says that just iconic line, um, you forgot the first rule of remakes, Jill. I the, I think the only time I've ever done this in a theater, I saw it opening night, pack crowd. <laughs> I literally jumped up in my and went, Yes, I was so happy that Sydney Prescott was not going to die after four movies by that, that was br- just, by that brat. Yeah. <laughs> Quintessential Wes in Scream, which comes back yeah. to the first movie where, you know, we have so the definition of these rules of horror and they play out throughout this film and the twist at the end with the killers. Yeah. It's Yeah, and we don't really think of amazing. like a horror film as having a great screenplay, but Scream is definitely one of them, right? Just, it's, totally. not, it's more than just scary and funny. Like, the way that the story kind of weaves its way through and all the twists and things, it's like, it's a really solid script too. So um, I think that's why they all, you know, got on board and wanted to do it right at the time mm-hmm. because 95, 96 horror was like dead. There was like nothing around that time. Right. Yeah. You know, mostly direct to video stuff. So scream was the resurgence and then it became, you know, <laughs> there was like a whole new kind of horror film in the late nineties. Right. I think Halloween H2O would have been a different movie if it had been made, you know, without Scream having come along, I think, you know, a lot of these movies, you know, ha- had a lot of Scream in them. Um, my other yeah. runners up for that decade uh, would be The Sounds of the Lambs. If we consider that a horror film, I do. Yeah, <laughs> um, I agree. And then I got to pick a, a Stephen King adaptation every decade, right? So my other favorite would be, <laughs> would be uh, Misery. Have you seen, have you seen Misery? Okay. You have know, you- I have not. Oh my God. I have so not. Good. And I know it's a big, uh, it's such a big piece. And Kathy Bates, who have, yeah. has been recently debated with her performance in Richard Jewell on our podcast. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know she's incredible here. And I haven't read the book either, but I've heard good things about both. Oh, a great book, too. It's an easy read. It's like 290 pages, not very long. Uh, it, it stays pretty close to the film, unlike The Shining. The book is pretty similar to the movie. Uh, Rob yeah. Reiner directed Misery, right? So he goes from When Harry Met Sally... This wow. great, this great Classic, romantic yeah. comedy. To a year later, he's directing Misery. <laughs> this like horror film, <laughs> and uh, you know, he says on the on the DVD Blu-ray, he says like, "Yeah, I was studying a lot of Hitchcock for months," and you can tell, like, he did his homework of like how to really pace the suspense scene, and mm-hmm. and uh, you know, if you're a writer, it like really hits home this idea of like I have to write to stay alive. It's like such such a great story and then the performances by both James Conn and Kathy Bates are just out of this world they're so right. good in it they have great chemistry as kind of rivals in the movie and mm-hmm. and and where it goes in the last 10 minutes is like you are on the edge of your seat you're like how is this going to end how is he going to survive it's so good um so yeah if you haven't seen misery that's, that's definitely on my on my list i have to another stephen king film from the decade was it okay the which mini, think... the mini series with tim curry Right, yeah. right. And I th- I think the book is incredible. It's a huge, it's like 1100 pages. It's yeah. crazy. It's, it's long. not something you read in a night. No, it's, <laughs> it was that's a great like, summer book. Yeah, that's a summer book. That's when you start after the last a, day of school, and then you finish a it full a few days. three months. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
That's actually how I read it. I read it once in high school and I just, it's just too long. I haven't wanted to revisit it too long. And then no. when they were shooting the new version uh, for 2017 and it, came, it was coming out in September, I said, okay, uh, I guess that's my summer book. So I started in like early June and I finished it right before the movie came out. I watched it before the remake and was so disappointed by the remake. And I think the original is a lot more campy, uh -huh. which makes it more acceptable and fun. Mm -hmm. You okay. can't really beat Tim Curry as uh, Pennywise. Okay, cool. That's our first disagreement. I absolutely love it. It was on my top ten list. I think it's. I think it's the fantastic. recent one. The recent one. Yeah. Okay. I thought. I thought. I thought the clown was terrifying. I loved the cast of oh. the kids. You didn't think the clown I, was scary in the? No, in I. I really didn't, and maybe it felt too over the top for me okay but a lot of his accent his like high pitch accent and the cgi work that happened around yeah, him a and his too movements much yeah and i think that kind of took me out enough where i was like okay this you know but it wasn't what, what i what i enjoyed about it is that it, it was it was like two and a half hours it took its time you really got to know the kids there were lots of scenes of them just kind of being kids and being together it was like a really nice like coming of age it wasn't just about mm -hmm. the scares and i kind of appreciated that it could have been you know a 90 minute movie where it was just about this this clown and the scares. right it really like ta it takes its time um i definitely had more issues with chapter two which had, <laughs> which had some problems yeah uh but i thought well, the first I, one was was pretty decent I, I think that adds to it is that it's a five hour, two movie extravaganza where you're trying to get this whole story through and that yeah. doesn't even happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, the cast for part two was great. But oh yeah, Bill I, Hader I was even, great. I didn't even see part two. Oh, um, you didn't see <laughs> I, I was intrigued by the story of the more adult versions of these kids in the, in the book, but mm -hmm. one just, I, you know, from it was really from what I heard from people that two is more disappointing than one, and I already wasn't a, a part of it, so I really wasn't going to subject so, myself so to two all, and a half hours. Yeah, so I got the sense that most people liked the original, the the, the twenty seventeen it. People, did, I mean, it made like eight hundred million dollars. Like people wouldn't see when they saw it. Was it was a big, <laughs> it was a big hit. Yeah, I, I think it was just disappointing from reading the book, like. Mm a month or two before. So it was really oh, okay. fresh in my mind of expecting these terrifying sequences and eventually seeing that the sequel changed some of the mm -hmm. scarier parts, you know, to fit cinema. Um, yeah, maybe I was just a little bit of an easy critic on that one. I just was like, okay. I, I, it had been a long time since a really quality Stephen King adaptation. And I was mm -hmm. pretty happy. I was. I saw it opening night in a crowded theater. People were laughing. People was, per, were people were screaming. Mm -hmm. I had a great time. I didn't. I didn't walk out of the 2017 it like. Well, that could have been better. I was like okay. feeling really good. I was like, I'm very very happy with where they took that. So I don't know. <laughs> I liked it. Um, but yeah, the originals. I, I agree. Tim Curry. It's hard to beat Tim Curry. Yeah. He's such a like. I mean, the characters he created. You know, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And then one of my 10 favorite movies is Clue from the 80s. It's like oh, absolutely iconic. love Clue. <laughs> like, it, is not, it is not horror, but I completely consider it in the, the comedy horror genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like a madcap slapstick. I mean, it's, it's hard to kind yeah. of designate what genre Clue is. It's right. Like every, it's like everything. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Because you have the sequences where it's dark and, you know, they're killing people and it's... But it's unsettling <laughs> it's it's scary but yeah at the on the other hand it's funny and the 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 script is just amazing you know madeline khan and madeline khan's uh, finest, finest hour for me is clue like, just she, is just amazing. On, she is on another level <laughs> of hilarious i mean it she you will be laughing at something she's saying missing the next funny part <laughs> that she's right <laughs> You know, how many husbands that's, do you have? Mine or other women's? <laughs> like the way she's just, it's so quick. It's like, it's so, yeah, miss exactly. It. <laughs> but, and that's uh, what makes, that's why you need to rewatch it every, every year. Like yeah, once, once I, a year. I yeah. It. It's not every year, but every couple of years, I just put that on. It's 90 minutes or less, right? It's really short. So quick. But it's yeah. really fun. Uh, any other films from the 90s that we didn't talk about? We talked about New Nightmare. That would definitely be in my honorable mentions definitely worth a look if you've seen the original if you're in, in you're, you're into into that character and yeah that world 
uh, like Heather Langkamp comes back. She plays herself being yeah. like stalked by a fan of the, of the movie. And her, she like stumbles upon her kid watching the original movie. And so there's just like an interesting like meta aspect to okay. New Nightmare, which came out two years before Scream, right? So Wes Craven, he's always kind of working in this kind of meta aspect, like a movie, a horror film about horror films, right? It's something that hadn't really been done up until New Nightmare. So His trajectory is, is very interesting. Um, there needs to be a, a biography on him because oh, yeah. he, he did a lot and went in so many directions. I think another one that stems from Scream is I Know What You Did Last Summer. Yep. That's from 1986 or 1997. Yep, uh, 97. Um, so yeah, that was the second uh, script by Kevin Williamson that got, uh, was made into a film. And not so much like Scream, more of a traditional horror film, but that's a really fun one too. I like that one. Mm -hmm. A great slasher. Even the sequel holds up. To me, it's, it's fine. It's, you know, not as great as the I Sarah Michelle I Geller version. I, st I still know. <laughs> yeah. you Brandy. Have, yes, you have Brandy and the uh, tanning booth. It's it's a great film. You know, it's <laughs> terrifying. You have this man who won't die and it's it's a fun time. <laughs> yeah, the second one is more fun than scary. Like there's actually like some scary moments in the first I know. Right. <laughs> um, real quick, you, you, you know, you're talking about Wes Craven. I mean, I would you have a favorite horror director? He would probably be my favorite. If I had to pick one director of horror films, the one where it's not just one or two of their movies that I love. It's you know, their whole career, you know, Wes Craven goes all the way back to Last House on the Left in 72 and Hills of Eyes in 77. And he was a college professor. Like he taught English. And then wow. like at 30, 30 years old, he was like, you know what? I think I want to go make, make movies. movies. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Know? So he's had such a fascinating career. I actually interned for his company in 2007. I went to film school in Los Angeles, uh, worked wow. for his company for four months. He came in one day <laughs> in four months. And it was a big deal. Like, like I was like working on something and yes, may I help? Oh, uh, yeah. Hello, Mr. Craven. <laughs> you know, do you need coffee? You know, <laughs> ring the bell. And the movie, the movie of his that came out that, that semester I was in college was The Hills Have Eyes 2, the remake, okay. where, which he co-wrote with his son, Jonathan. Uh, and so I got to go to the premiere of the sequel and I got to go say hi to him at that. And Very cool. That's and awesome. I'm, and I'm like, you know, I want, what I want to say is not your strongest <laughs> Mr. Craven. But instead, I was like, oh, yeah, so nice to meet you. Um, so yeah, that was really fun. And I actually, uh, I wrote a screenplay about his life a few years ago. It's just sitting in the oh drawer. I don't really know what to do with it. It's called Craven. Yeah, and it's about, it's about the making of Last House on the Left. It's about his transition from teaching to becoming a, a horror filmmaker. So it's about like a kind of like that Lincoln idea, right? Where you just take a little small window mm -hmm. of his life. And yeah, I was like, Ryan Gosling should play him. Like, I like, I was like, I casting. I, didn't, I, don't, know. I don't know what to do with it. I've like sent it out. You're, to yeah, you're sitting on this biography <laughs> that I just I'm mentioned. Like, this could, you, get, this yeah. could get Ryan Gosling an Oscar yeah, nomination. Pick it up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm a big Wes Craven fan. And hope, hopefully, hopefully that story will come to fruition one of these days. Um, I think he, he, he is one of the bigger ones. I think we have Ari Aster recently. Yeah. which we just have to see what he does with his career. But he's had two such strong films so far in the past few years. So I'm excited to see what he does. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, talk about, and we'll get to him at the end, I'm sure. <laughs> We're talking mm -hmm. about Ari Aster. Uh, you know, I've ne I don't think I've ever seen such a confident debut <laughs> of a film, a horror film totally. like that. Um, but before we get to the, pre the, the newest decade, right? So let's look at the 2000s. Between yep. 2000 and 2009, anything in there that you thought was really great horror-wise? There are a lot of decent films from this decade. Okay, nothing, nothing that, that really like blows your way. sticks out to me. I think Saw is one that really defined this new absolutely few, you know, couple decades of gore and Jigsaw as this new villain, kind mm -hmm. of. Um, Really, really fresh in the original Saw. Not so much by the time we get to like the seventh one. <laughs> Five, you know, we have we have Jigsaw. I think actually that was delayed until next year as well. But oh, there's the another Rock there's version, another one. Oh, right, Chris a, Rock. Yeah, yeah, he's involved with it, Saw. It, there are some stills released, and he's like covered in blood. Um, Interesting. That so, is not yeah. something 
I would not put Chris Rock and Saw together. <laughs> not whatever. <laughs> no, but hey, you never know. It could be really good. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think yeah. some big ones for me are, I would say top two are The Descent, mm -hmm. which is a really, really great zombie monster film. Yeah. Um, and then The Orphanage. Okay. Yeah. Which yeah. is a Spanish film. Yeah. Super creepy. Um, yeah. Those to me. And The Ring as well. Kind of yeah. all over the place, but yeah. iconic villains and stories that kind of stick with you and terrify you. Seven the, ring, days. the Ring's another one. Ring is only PG-13. That's pretty scary for a That's crazy. Uh, That's... Definitely cemented uh, Naomi Watts as a major yeah. talent. Uh, you know, I've talked about that on the podcast before about you know how she was uh, acting for 10 years and she could just not get any momentum to her career. And she almost quit when she got Mulholland Drive. Um, okay. which if we if we considered Mahal and Drive a horror film, that would be my pick for the best horror film of the decade. But that <laughs> one's I can't really call that a horror film, even though Lynch it's is horrific. yeah, yeah. We haven't even talked about David Lynch. He's one of my probably my five favorite filmmakers. His work is okay. unbelievable. Uh, and it's I know a lot, a lot of people don't like him because you have to really think about his films. You know. Yeah, I I'm not, probably in that. Not not a, not a big fan of David Lynch. Not a huge fan. I saw uh Mulholland recently mm -hmm. it was in the fall before COVID and oh, okay the cinematographer was in the audience and he did a Q&A afterwards oh, cool. which is incredible mm -hmm. it was so cool to hear him talk and I learned about how it was supposed to be a series on HBO and they turned it into a film yeah. so then partway through the movie is when they transitioned from like the first series to part two and they just joined everything together which was a great conversation, but it didn't make me love it any more <laughs> than I did. Well, it always kind of strikes me is that it was originally shot for television, but yet it looks absolutely striking. The cinematography right. is absolutely right. like, a, like a theatrical film. So that always kind of mm -hmm. surprises me. Like in 99, 2000, like people were shooting pilots that looked that good. I'm like, okay. <laughs> there's Yeah, there's no way. I, I think the performance by Naomi is more of a television one. Okay. At least like an HBO show, but <laughs> yeah. it, it also transforms into more than that. So it's Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a it's an yeah. interesting I mean, he, film. his work definitely touches on horror. I mean, I would I would suggest his first film Eraserhead from 77 is a That horror, one too, yeah. It's kind of a horror film. I mean, it's you don't really think of David Lynch as a horror director, but his work definitely is uh it, it definitely stays with you <laughs> like the best mm -hmm. horror films do. Um, yeah, so you mentioned most the most of the titles on my list. Uh, my favorite horror okay. film of that decade is The Descent. That was a crazy. That I saw that opening night with a big audience. That was like terrifying. Um, <laughs> it's been a long time since I've watched it. Uh, it's been at least probably yeah. five or six years. It's not. It's not one of the horror films, and I feel like this way about most of the horror films from like 2000 to 2009. You don't really revisit them as much as some other decades, right? Like, um, like I love the original Saw. That would be in my runners up. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's not one I necessarily want to rewatch all the time because they're so overly bloody and gruesome and kind of like right. hard to watch sometimes. Yeah. They're after saw like Oh five, Oh six, Oh seven. Right. We get a lot of these like extremely violent torture porn, gruesome, you yeah. know, that was the window that, you know, Rob zombies, Halloween came along and I just okay. don't, you know, one, one and done. It's a lot. <laughs> Some of yeah. It's a lot for sure. Yeah. I, I I think Paranormal Activity was this resurgence of yep, that's old nine, footage, yeah. and that was that was also iconic. I watched that in my <laughs> in my dorm room on okay. my laptop, and that was <laughs> terrifying. Um, on your laptop, <laughs> yeah, I think that was yourself. why it was. <laughs> yep, in the yeah. dark, that I was terrified. Um, Here, here's a funny you want to hear a, a piece of trivia about that so when that movie was coming out in the fall of 2009 I was working very closely with its director Oren Pelly oh my gosh on, uh, I, I worked in feature film casting for two years and I was working with him on his follow-up called Area 51 okay which uh, he made in the fall of 09 yeah so we were like casting that movie wow. as paranormal was like building and building and building until remember it kind of like opened up all around the country like different weekends it wasn't just like yeah. one day um and so like i sat with oren pelly at the la premiere like two seats down <laughs> i got oh the premiere because we'd been working close together for about That's six incredible. months 
Um, and then the movie we worked on together ultimately came out in 2015 and was not good. <laughs> what was that? Area 51. Area 51? Yeah. Okay. It, came, it came and went. It was just, it just didn't have the same, it had kind of the same structure as paranormal activity, but it didn't yeah. quite work as well. It sounds familiar. But so that was kind of a really unique time, like where I was working with this guy, nobody knew who Oren Pelly was. And he had this little movie that may or may yeah. not come out theatrically called Paranormal Activity. And, you know, and then, and then it becomes this it absolute up. sensation crazy thing. Yeah. And uh, gosh, what a, I mean, talk about a success story. Just this little movie with two people for the most part. Um, and it's terrifying that last five minutes. I mean, it's like, like really, really well done. And yeah. the fact that it started as like this little home movie to what, I mean, he talked to me like, yeah, I, did, I was hoping to get into some film festivals. Like that was it. I didn't even think it would come out theatrically. So, <laughs> so pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that would definitely be in my runners up would be the, the first paranormal. I like some of the sequels. The third one I remember was pretty scary, but, uh, the first yeah. one was definitely the best. Even two was decent. I, yeah. They all play in kind of different tropes of the genre in different settings. So yeah, and this is also the decade we get a lot of remakes, right? We get Texas Chainsaw right. kind of started us off, and then we get Dawn of the Dead. Uh, we get uh, The Hills Have Eyes. We get Halloween. Mm -hmm. I mean, Friday the Thirteenth was oh nine. Pretty much every franchise got a remake between in that like ten year period from like oh three to twenty thirteen, right? Pretty much everything. Okay. <laughs> uh, a Evil lot Dead. we Evil had that came later 2013 right uh we have two bong joon ho films from this decade the host and mother which are mm -hmm. i yeah. love mother so much yeah. terrifying maybe you know maybe not horror i also i can mention i saw the devil which came the next decade which is just so gory mm -hmm but it, it rests in this Korean horror genre, which is incredible. And they, yeah. they kind of do horror like no other. Yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't really talked about foreign horror films and that's the one kind of side of my horror movie past mm -hmm. that it, it's, it's lacking for sure. I need to kind of explore yeah. more uh, foreign horror films. Uh, but yeah, I've seen both of those you mentioned. Those were really strong. Audition is really good. That came out, I want to say 98, maybe. I, don't that th I think it was the 90s. Yeah, that yeah. was the 90s. That one I watched on Shudder. Uh, about a year ago that one was really that's good, really well that's done. really gruesome yeah <laughs> it's, then, not, it's not an easy watch that's anyway. no that, um and then oh, house we get back to 77 house on which the, is a criterion label right yes yeah, i and, watched that that's great Raven. um unexpected i guess <laughs> is a word i would use that's uh that's an odd one yeah, and I just remembered. Uh, I think '06 it came out was High Tension, which was a foreign film that then they dubbed. Okay. They dubbed into English. The version <laughs> I saw, uh, it was like a what was it? it was like a screening that I saw like before it was out or something, and they had the the foreign film with subtitles, and I loved that. Uh, apart from like the last fifteen seconds, <laughs> like the last, <laughs> you're like, uh, I don't know about that last little twist. Um, but for the most part, that was a really great film. So yeah, there's there's been a bunch. I should have written a few more down. I just maybe can't think yeah. of them right now. Um, this but, is the the decade that I have the most written down for. Okay, yeah. So any other? I have one more to talk about. You know, we haven't talked about Stephen King in a while, so we got to talk about Stephen King. <laughs> I know you said you have one from every decade. Yeah, could, could, the other you, one. Yeah, go ahead. The other one I'll mention before you mention him is The Strangers, which oh, is right. yeah, just yeah. downright terrifying. Also, <laughs> so good. So good. That came out on, uh, what was it, uh, two years ago or something. I, I came across like a $5 copy of the Scream Factory, uh, you know, Blu-ray disc that they did for, for mm -hmm. The Strangers. And it had a lot of cool like bonus features. Um, and I hadn't seen it since it came out. And I forgot how scary that is. That's a really, yeah. really great movie. It's Liv the Tyler masks. And Skeet, uh, Scott Speedman and the masks of the villains. And just this idea that you could be in the middle of nowhere and just at what, 4 a.m. you just get a knock at the door. And it's like, uh, you know, that, that's like my like worst nightmare is to be like alone in a house, like somewhere, yeah. maybe like not where there's people. Get terrorized, <laughs> you know, yeah, kind of like that's... the opening of Scream, right? Where she's alone in that house and the farm mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but uh, this idea that what if someone knocked on the door at 4 a.m. and would not leave and, you know, for whatever reason, you can't call 911 or like, like there's no way out. Uh, yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, so the Stephen King adaptation of the year, it's not perfect, but I love is The Mist from 2007. Did you see that Okay. One? Yeah, uh, I, I've seen that. Yeah. Kind of a, you know, kind of a creepy take on his novella from his Skeleton Crew collection. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I don't like the CG, right? There's like five or six scenes where there's- it's Yeah, it's not heavy. great. <laughs> Especially now, looks really dated, but Marsha Gay Harden is amazing <laughs> in that movie as the religious nut. And yeah. uh, I, 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 you know, the ending of that movie, you, you can't just, you can't just kind of shrug and walk out of the theater or walk away. I mean, that is an ending you kind of sit with for, and you're like, what? How did Frank Darabont get away with that ending? I mean, that's crazy. What happened, <laughs> you know? Like, how did he get away with that? Uh, and I don't believe Darabont has made another feature film since he, he developed The uh, Walking Dead. Uh, okay. But, there, but there's a filmmaker who mostly just made Stephen King adaptations. He did The Shawshank Redemption, which I believe is still number one favorite movie on IMDb. It has to be. Yeah. yeah. It's been that for a so while. Good. And then he did The Green Mile. His follow-up was, he said, what should I do as a follow-up movie? Let's I should make... Let's do what about a Stephen King prison drama? You know, we'll go with that. And then he finally did a Stephen King horror novella and did The Mist, which I I, I really enjoyed it. So that would be on huh. my runners when it was up. You didn't like that one? Uh, wasn't my favorite. What's your favorite? Okay. Um, I've seen that a few years ago, so okay. I I remember the drama of it. I think it's an interesting concept, mm -hmm. and again, this takeover of a monster in general which we've seen yeah a bit lately mm -hmm. so yeah but i just i love the concept right we're in this uh, grocery store and you have different personalities yeah. trying to fight it out and these you know and these like demons and monsters are coming in and no one knows what to do and he's just trying to mm -hmm. protect it he's trying to protect his son in the whole movie and um a lot of good tension in it. I, I thought it, that was one of the stronger stephen king adaptations of the last 20 years for sure um okay so yeah so that takes us to our the last decade uh what was our favorite film horror film of the last 10 years this is like top three. It has to be. It might even be my favorite, but it's hereditary, and that's hands down. There's just Aster, no yeah. other way. Yeah. And again, I've had people mention, you know, this isn't horror; it's psychological. But it's a horror film. The it's it's an occult <laughs> film. It's yeah. so many subgenres of horror. There's just no way around it, and it's terrifying. It's Tony Collette's best performance, I would say. It's. All right, all right, Nick. How did she not get nominated for that? <laughs> like I've been asking oh, that question. Believe for... me, believe me. She was a shoe in nominee what on happened? my list. What happened? How did that not happen? I mean, she's so <laughs> overwhelmingly, insanely good in that movie. Like, how does that right. just get a critics award nom and that's it? It's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. It's it's uh. you know, like how do you I mean, did I guess just enough people didn't see it? Is that the problem with it? Like enough. People it's probably a horror thing. I mean, horror thing? you know, horror was so undocumented in awards history, as we yeah. kind of mentioned. And, you know, I mean, Kathy it's, Bates, it's if sad. Kathy Bates can win for Misery, I feel like Hereditary, right? Tony Collette should be nominated. I mean, it was it I incredibly mean, it was a, so. Yeah. It was a pretty strong year. I mean, Melissa McCarthy and Can You Ever Forgive Me? <laughs> Do we have to nominate that over Tony Collette? I don't know. <laughs> it was a good movie, but very, no, very good film. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I think the follow up to her, um, her performance was Lupita Nyongos and us, which I think was just out of also, this world. Also outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. So two, two upsetting snub nominees. Yeah. And Tony's rant as you know, her mother speech will just go down in history as one of the best ever at, at the dinner table with the three of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've shown that scene to students. <laughs> students who have no idea what the movie's about, I just show them that, <laughs> and then I say, "What this it, is how you write a movie." And this then I say, "And then it. I and then I say, deserved a nomination, right?" And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, "But yeah, I mean, the acting across the board in that film is really outstanding." Um, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Nat Nat Wolf is that his name? The boy, the son. Yes, yes. Nat Wolf. He's great he in that played, movie too. Yeah, I I dressed up as Payman for Halloween last year. Nice. <laughs> the the broken nose and the the crown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that Just scene in that amazing. scene in the classroom, right? It's so good when he's like like really terrifying. Um, Bang I just said, remember. Yeah. I remember how exciting it was to sit down for that movie. It had been a while, right? Since a really great horror film, and I just remember like 20, 30 minutes in, I was like, you could just kind of feel like this director knows what he's doing. He has, you know, obviously an affection for this genre. And there is no, there's no accidental steps being taken here. He is taking us on the journey and I, I am trusting in him every step of the way. 
uh, you know, even moments that are kind of slow, don't have a lot of scares, whatever. It's always like a fascinating story. Um, you know, the character, I think the best horror films are when you really identify with, you care about the people on the screen and you really feel that way in Hereditary. I mean, you have this clucking noise as this iconic score in a way or yeah. theme. And that only adds to it. And he, he really, really redefined this framing for a horror film. I mean, nobody expected that 20 minutes in what, you know, I'm not going to spoil it, but what would happen would happen. And it just changes the entire dynamic of the film. And from there on, you're just, you just sit back and you just have to take it in because you don't know what's going to happen. You you can't expect (laughs) anything. Exactly. Anything goes. Yeah. And that's just, what's so exciting. And you have Anne Dowd in this performance that, you know, every time she, she kills it too. Um, oh yeah, I love Anne Dowd in, in anything. Like she she all, she'll pop up right. in a minor film and she always makes it better. Uh, yeah, and she's great in that. Um, yeah, I just like you know that scene you're talking about. We, we won't give it away, but you know <laughs> every other director would have left it at that, right? That's shocking enough. We're like an aw- we're just in right. complete shock that's, in the audience. That's a finale. But then he takes it further and takes him home. And then we oh. leave the camera on his face while Colette <laughs> discovers what happened. Uh. <laughs> and we just stay on the boy's face as he hears her, the mom screaming. That's when I was like, okay, this is not just going to be a solid horror. This film. is this not is okay. Be, this is going yeah. to be something really spectacular. When we got to that part, I was like, oh my God. Um, yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, everything up to the end, right? And as we would find out with his follow up, uh, Midsomar, the next year, like he, doesn't play by the rules he takes things in you know extremely dark and surreal places that mm-hmm. you don't expect and he's kind of got to go along for the ride with this guy i don't is he doing is he working on a follow-up is he does he have a third film in development he must be i'm i, I really years. don't know oh yeah, yeah i that was last year so yeah i mean it might be a little bit longer but i have been waiting on seeing the midsummer director's cut which was that's right yeah uh praised by marty scorsese and okay i i loved the cgi work in midsummer too apart mm-hmm. from the story and i i like how his films are kind of retellings of these old stories where you know hereditary was rosemary's baby and midsummer was the wicker man and it's it's still something you don't expect Mm-hmm. or you don't know going into it and you develop what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting where, yeah, where his next movie will take him. So yeah, I haven't even like looked him up. Like, I don't even know. Did, did, did he come from short films? Like, where did he come from? Like, he just like showed up on he the scene. He came from nowhere. He you know? Was, yeah, he was a force and people said, you know, oh shoot, he attra- is a name attract- attracted, attracted major talent for his first feature film. I mean, for Tony Collette to sign on, to, uh, you know, a debut feature film and for it to be that strong. Um, exactly i mean to have that name attached i mean you knew it was going to be something special and i mean currently in imdb he doesn't have any upcoming projects so really yeah surprising he just shows up in like one year's time (laughs) one year with two of these incredible films and and now now, he says no more (laughs) and now he's taking he's taking a terrence malick break he'll be back later like okay um any other let's hope it's sooner (laughs) Yeah, let's hope it's not. He just doesn't just leave for five years. Like, like let's let's yeah. let's work on our next one. Because yeah, I would love to see another twenty films by him. I know he's got a lot more stories to tell. Um, what other horror films from this decade? I talked about it, which we had. <laughs> mm-hmm. I really like it. What what other horror films of the decade? You mentioned it follows. It, it follows is absolutely one of my favorites too. I yeah. think it's it's a take on a story that nobody would have thought was scary as you had mentioned before about Mm -hmm. was a new nightmare. Yeah. About the dreams. And yeah, I think it's done so well with the cinematography and the camera work and using these really disturbing characters as, you know, the old woman who's following her through Mm -hmm. the school and even the pool sequence and you know how it leaves you on this feeling of wanting to look over your shoulder. I, I absolutely loved. And that would, that it was a silent, you know, sleeper from Sundance. It just, yeah. Kind oh, of oh, shook oh, that everybody. played at, that played at Sundance. I didn't know that. I think so. Yeah. It follows. 
Yeah, I mean, it's got a definite John Carpenter feel to it. The music is very John Carpenter. Uh, mm -hmm. I love just the cinematography of that. And just the, it's just like a, a, a feature film of just constant dread. <laughs> You're just like constantly like exactly. on the edge. And, and it, 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 you know, the director of that film did a great job. What's the director's name again? I just blanked on his name, but he's done. He did the, he did the newer David film. Robert Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah. He did the Under the Silver Moon, I think it's called with uh, Andrew Garfield was his recent film. Uh, that was... Yeah, he, that was not great. That was, I didn't, that was, I did not that was, like that that was not quite, it follows. Um, right. I mean, but again, like really cool cinematography and stuff, but uh, yeah, I think it follows is you know, successful work so far. It's really great. I think another one for me, I have a lot from the 2010s, but okay. I, I've mentioned cabin in the woods briefly. Yep. That's a good it's one. It's a great comedy <laughs> camp addition on you know kind of take on evil dead and a lot of horror of yeah. the past few decades mm -hmm. uh the conjuring is another big i think stepping stone into yep. demonic horror mm -hmm. which we don't really have done well and i mean the last really big film of that is rosemary's baby mm -hmm. 1968 um yeah. I and, so I have a controversial see. take on The Conjuring. I saw The Conjuring okay. opening night with a lot of friends. I did not find it that scary. I thought Ooh. The Conjuring Two was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I okay. prefer well. the sequel. The second one I thought with the nun was like that was too much for me. I couldn't take. It. <laughs> uh, I I admired The Conjuring One more than I was really terrified by it. Right, like I I enjoyed the ride, but I. There was not a single yeah. moment of the first Conjuring where I jumped out of my seat or was genuinely mm -hmm. scared. It was the sequel that did it. <laughs> did the job okay. for me. Well, but, you know, yeah. but whatever both, makes it work. I yeah, think, but both of them are really solid films. Yeah, I think Insidious kind of plays on this too. Where very good. One. Very good. Um, PG thirteen. <laughs> Which is insane. How was that PG-13? <laughs> Maybe we just need to look at the, the PG-13 horror films that come out and, and only watch those because those, <laughs> those are hits. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Insidious films are really strong. I've se I think I've seen all the sequels. I think the first one's the best of the group in that series. Okay. Um, I, also I like mean, you mentioned... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I also uh, really like uh, Sinister from 2012 i thought was pretty pretty spooky with ethan hawk and you're like no that was stupid <laughs> it's i i think it was stupid i think parts were spooky yeah but it made me jump a it, lot my I, I like bruised my friend's arm that's how scary i thought sinister <laughs> there like, were there were a couple parts but i think it revealed <laughs> things in an interesting way that almost made me guess what was going to happen. And it was okay. more upsetting than okay. I wanted it to be. Um, I mean, with the video footage and the mm -hmm. tree, you, I kind of was like, okay, you know, obviously they're in this house and things are going to happen. So um, Did I didn't see Sinister 2. I didn't see the second one either. I didn't hear it. Was okay. Good. That's on Netflix or something right okay. now. <laughs> Um, no, I don't plan on seeing that. Did you, did you see the article came out, I think, in the last week about, according to science, Sinister is the scariest movie of all time? Did you see that? <laughs> no. According to science, something to do with like, our bodil like bodily <laughs> reaction to horror films, so apparently Sinister is the scariest. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what that is. We can thank about. Ethan Hawke, you know, just, just did it for science, I guess. Yeah. He was also just a few months later did the purge right and that became a, a big franchise mm -hmm. of, the, of the last That's a big decade. one uh i preferred the sequels to the first one the first one is so claustrophobic you're just in that house i kind mm -hmm. of liked when we open up the world a little bit in the second uh, the next two um none of them are particularly great films but i thought they were entertaining yeah i think it's a really cool concept i haven't seen any of the purges okay i think it's just too close to reality maybe but <laughs> i Election I do year. like the idea. Yeah. <laughs> the third one. I, I'll get to them eventually. <laughs> Any other horror films from, from the last decade uh, that we haven't talked about? We have I've got, so I've got many. One, I've got one more. Um, uh, I think, you know, I have a few. VHS is oh, another yeah. one of this like home mm -hmm. footage. Mm -hmm. I think it was really done well. And more so that the, the sequel was such a good follow-up to the original. 
I really liked both of those. Okay, I have to see. I don't think I've seen the second one. I watched the original on uh, Shutter a couple years ago. I remember that being pretty scary. It's pretty good. I have to see the second one too. Yeah, it it takes it in a in a different way, but it's still the home footage. Um, scary, gruesome, gory, mm -hmm. sometimes demonic vibes. I think Hush. Yeah, really terrified me. That's another good one. Yeah, we haven't talked about uh, Mike Flanagan is, is his name, right? He's been doing great work, uh, you know, both in feature films and in television. His uh, The Haunting of Hill House in 2018 on Netflix was, was absolutely one. terrifying. Yeah. One of the scariest anything. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, you could call it a show. It's, it was kind of like an eight part series. Uh, yeah. Such a great piece of work, that show. That was... You know, Shirley Jackson wrote that, and I, mm -hmm. I really do want to go back and read that. I didn't mm -hmm. watch the whole series, but I think the fact that, you know, it was adapted from a novel, I'm mm -hmm. excited. Yeah, and then uh, the new one, uh, The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is currently on Netflix, uh, mm -hmm. not quite as scary as the 2018 Hill House, but still really, okay. really strong, um, based on The Taming of the Shrew. Uh, which uh, by Henry James. And so it's a little bit different in tone and everything from the 2018 mm -hmm. ha haunting series, but definitely worth looking at. Great cast in the new one too. Okay. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's a lot. What else, <laughs> a what lot. else do you have? What My, the you the, have the other decade? one I wanted to mention uh, was from 2010, the vampire film, Let Me In, which is a remake of the yeah. Let, Let the Right Let One the In, right the one in. Yeah. which is kind of controversial, right? Because I think most people agree that Let the Right One In, the the, the foreign film, is better. But I didn't see the foreign film until after I saw the American one. So the, so my entry into that story was Matt Reeves' 2010 uh, version, and I was mm -hmm. like not knocked out by it. I still think about it 10 years later. It's a, just a really strong, quiet occasionally terrifying horror film great yeah uh, child performances in that and uh just a really Chloe, strong right film. she Chloe was grace moretz yeah that was the year of uh of kick ass was first and then let me in so that kind of catapulted her career a little bit okay. I, haven't seen, I haven't seen her in a while she's been in anything lately uh she's a she really strong was actress. she was in suspiria oh right the remake yeah yep and uh she was in another film which I don't we, know we what did, she's going to be mention, next. We didn't mention a Suspiria. That's a really great 70s horror film, too. That That is one of my favorites, uh, too. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, if I, I think if Dario, Dario, Dario Argento is, was an amazing filmmaker. He had Deep Red and Inferno that, you know, both I still need to watch mm -hmm. um, in the Jalo films. Yeah, I, I, I have a long list of uh, Argento films to get to. I haven't seen very many yeah. of them. But Suspiria is definitely one I've seen a couple times and really, really great production design and cinematography. And uh, mm -hmm. I, love look, I love the look of that film. The colors and the look the is, colors. is where it stands. And yeah. I like where Luca took things in the sequel. Mm -hmm. But I kind of, I like to look at it as a, like to look at it as a, reboot or a, a an accompanied okay. piece to the original because it does take it in a little bit of a different direction mm -hmm. um not always the same i think the ending is a bit outlandish but you know we get all of these mothers fighting for this position <laughs> and yeah we get to see mother marcos in the end and mm -hmm. it's it's very unique and mm -hmm. i think our that just speaks to argento and what he did in the 70s yeah absolutely uh, any other films from the last 10 years that we didn't touch on? I feel like, uh, did we talk about the Babadook? That's There's that's one so I enjoyed. Many. Babadook, that's a, that ending terrified me. I might have screamed in the theater. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, Jennifer Kent, right? The director of that, female director. Great, great, uh, great film there. Mm -hmm. I think she had a follow-up recently. I don't think I've seen it, but uh, she had something recent in the last yeah. two years too. Um, hmm. Any other horror films? I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, A Quiet Us. Place. Oh, A Quiet Place. Us. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was that was on my top ten of 2018. I totally forgot about a quiet place. Great, movie. and John Krasinski. Yeah, who knew? Where did that come from? <laughs> he had directed <laughs> uh, he had directed two kind of like dramedies, right? Like before that, or comedy dramas. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like I mean, you know, he got approached with that project. I think just a star in it, if I if I remember that correctly. And he read it and he said, I want to make this. Like, I want to direct this movie and, you know, try, you know, hopefully get uh, my wife to be in it. And boy, exactly. What a great, what a great uh, <laughs> film to kind of pair them together. They were so, both so good. I was so happy when 
Emily Blunt won the SAG award for that performance because she's amazing. amazing in that movie. Just unexpected. You know, another year where Emily Blunt had two great performances, but did not go recognized by the Academy. <laughs> still seeking her first Oscar nomination, Emily Blunt. I thought she definitely deserved a nomination for A Quiet Place. She was great in that. But she again, was good. Horror films, you know, it's a little bit trickier to get nominated for those. We'll see. I think part two that was that was also delayed. Yeah. That was coming out. Year. That was coming out right when everything shut down, March twenty. Yeah. So have to wait Other, a little bit longer for that one. Yeah. So another another zombie pick was Train to Busan. That's a really good one. Okay, I don't know that one. What's it called? Train to Busan. Yeah, Train to Busan. Okay. It's a. It's an Asian film. Okay. It's about this this uh, disease that turns you into a zombie. So very much like Alive, which is on Netflix right now. Okay. Uh, very well done though. And there was a sequel that just came out. I think it was out of competition at Cannes. Okay. This year called Peninsula. But the original cool. Train to Busan is very, very good. I will say that. Um another there were a lot from this decade i mean we have some some comedy in happy death day oh yeah that was happy fun death i enjoyed day happy you. death day yep those were such fun. a such a good time you know i think it uh yeah plays on a lot of things like uh, cabin in the woods and kind of, um, kind of surprising that it took that long for someone to do a horror version of the of groundhog day <laughs> like it's like yeah. wow, I, i'm surprised that it you know why didn't i think of that in the 2000s <laughs> like, yeah you know it came along i was like oh that makes sense that would be a really great concept for a horror film um, a lot of these things it's like dang why didn't you think of that yeah you mentioned zombie films i forgot to uh, one of my favorite zombie films ever is uh Shaun of the dead right which isn't scary yeah uh, but that yeah. was 04. Uh, and then 28 Days Later, a year before that, 03, mm -hmm. by uh, Danny Boyle is also a really strong film. Yep. So, Two yeah, I mean, zombies, I feel like with The Walking Dead, you know, kind of petering out, I feel like zombie films have been kind of, you know, <laughs> they, they, they haven't, uh, we haven't seen too many of them the last few years, right? It was a, it was a craze for a while. Yeah. yeah I think it's dying down. Dying down. Yeah. It's. And then thinking of like the future of horror, I don't know where it's going to take things, you know. Where with, do we go in the next 10 years? It's 2020, the start of a new decade. What do we, what do we think? What's coming? Everything's been remade. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we've, so now we're in this, this year, this year we had host, which is a play on, you know, COVID. Oh, right. Zoom, yeah, yeah. I haven't watched that yet. Is, is, that worth, is that worth to, looking at? It, it is good. I do like it. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. I, it's on my list. It's there are some really scary parts to that. And okay. we've had the rental this year as well. And that's pretty scary. That's like an Airbnb kind of horror film. Is that the one with uh Dave Franco? Is he involved with that or am I thinking of something else? He he directed it. Okay, he directed and then it. Allison Brie is Allison in Brie. it. And mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So that, is that available? A, a is that cast. out now? Is that like on streaming? It's a yeah, it's definitely streaming. The rental. Um I'm not sure where, but yeah, I'm sure okay. it's out. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely want to take a look at that. I, at that least somehow, to rent. It was hard this past summer to keep up with everything coming there's out because so it wasn't really still so much. You know, yeah, there's still a lot I have to catch up on. I th think I posted on Twitter a few days ago. I'm like, someone recommend 2020 movies to me because I'm like, <laughs> I've, with this podcast and with so many things, I'm like just constantly watching older stuff and I'm not catching a lot up of with all the new. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there haven't been enough in uh, you know like the last six months films I haven't seen too many of them so uh definitely They're want to coming. check out the rental uh and then i mean i'll be curious to see what happens with the other franchises but we touched on the 2018 halloween a little bit but this idea of like you can just like erase all the sequels and just what if you make a, a sequel that's just like a direct sequel uh, to the original with something kind of bold right and i at the time mm -hmm. wasn't sure if that would work i'm like but those movies exist like how do we avoid but you you know 20 minutes into the new halloween and you just are like okay i'll go with it the yeah. Laurie Strode did not die in resurrection. <laughs> He's back. And gosh, it was, I was just watching the new Halloween. Like, I'm just so happy that we got another Laurie right. Strode movie with, with Jamie Lee Curtis right. kicking ass in that third Even act. Even more. Um, yeah. Even. You know? And all the little touches to the original, right. Of like the granddaughter looking out the classroom window and seeing not Michael Myers, but Laurie Strode. And then 
when she falls off the roof at the end and Michael gets that experience of turning around and the body is yeah. not on the ground. I mean, there were so many cool touches that always felt authentic and true to the story. It didn't feel like just, you know, David Gordon Green winking at you. And like, right. you know, it wasn't a perfect film. There were some, I had some issues with um, that, like Dr. Loomis character guy. There were some things about it I didn't love, but for the most okay. part, I was really happy with it. And I'm really excited to see Halloween Kills, which I, which I guess brings back a lot of the same characters from the first movie uh including many of the same actors who some mm -hmm. of which have kind of retired haven't haven't been seen i uh, charles cypher who played uh, sheriff brackett in the original i guess is in the okay. halloween kills and wow so that'll be that'll be exciting to see all that's these exciting that's again. really cool you know clearly yeah. david gordon green is a fan and wants to you know you know build on the mythology and bring back all these characters it'll be kind of fun to see how they all come back in the new in the new sequel which I don't know what we call it, Halloween 11? <laughs> I don't even know what it is. You know, it's like, it's so... I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see if Halloween ends, which is in two from now, Yep. if that is the end, or if it's, you know, just yeah, well, another name for it. Or, you know, if, yeah, if Lori's going to actually die and, you know, be done and they kind of, she and Michael kill each other. I mean, is really the only that's fitting how I thought that kind of that's how I thought the new one was going to end. I thought, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't want to do this character forever. Like what made sense to me was that because she has a daughter and a granddaughter who she cares about, I thought, okay, she's going to sacrifice herself, but at the same time, kill Michael. I thought that's how it was going to end. So when it didn't end like that, yeah. I was like, okay, uh, now we get two more. But yeah, especially calling it Halloween Ends. Um, I'll actually be surprised how much of the sequels Jamie Lee Curtis is in. Something tells me she's not going to be like the lead, right? Like something tells me she'll only be in part of the sequels. Um, but I, I will be surprised if at the end of the, of the third one of Halloween ends, mm -hmm. Laurie Strode is still with us. I kind of feel like the best way to go out would be to have her kill Michael at the same time, you know, he's killing her or something, some sort right. of mono a mono moment at the very end. Um, because if she doesn't die at the end, then they could just come back with another one. It's like, she's not going right. to be forever. She's 60, what, 61? With a different Michael. And I think she is such an <laughs> iconic part of Halloween. Yeah. There's no way you can do it without her. Yeah. No, and, but, you know, and, and we learned that in some of the, you know, 80s and 90s sequels. It's just not the same when, yeah. when Jamie Lee's not a part of it. It's just not the same. So... Uh, it, it, it'll be hard to get people interested in the series once her character is, is done. Right. And I assume, you know, maybe she's a part of these next two, but after that, I would be, is she going to come back for like a 60th anniversary? <laughs> she'll be like, <laughs> she'll be like in her eighties, like, like one more round, you know, <laughs> but then the, just the fact that they called it Halloween, right. They didn't call it Halloween. Right. Revisited. Something. <laughs> yeah. You know, they could have called it like the shape. They were like, we're just going to call it Halloween. There's been two. <laughs> there was the 78 and the 07. <laughs> we don't, those don't exist. You know? It's like, it's like Lee, Lee Daniels, the butler. Remember that big, uh, you know, hubbub mm -hmm. of like, we can't call it the butler because there was a 1918 short film. And it's like, well, wait a second. <laughs> How do these other films <laughs> get right. to be called the same title, yeah. you know, movie after movie? Um, but yeah, anyway, this has been so, so, so much fun, Nick. I mean, I, I, we could talk for another hour, but we've been going for almost two yeah. hours now. So I, 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 <laughs> I, uh, I, I did not expect this to go as long, but I should have known because, uh, you know, we both love horror films and we have a there's lot There's just to say. so much to talk yeah. about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At least we didn't, we didn't do, even mention. I mean, I'm sure there's many we didn't, we didn't talk about. Yeah. We didn't even go into horror films prior to 1970. So, I mean, that's a whole other... We left out Hitchcock entirely, which I think is probably yeah. for the best. But yeah. Well, you know, he had two films in the 70s. Neither one's really a horror film. I really like Frenzy, his one and only R-rated thriller from 1972, okay. which I'm sure I'll get to on the podcast, uh, what, just two years from now. Um, but uh, yeah, Hitchcock obviously played a huge, huge role in, in, in thrillers and horror and uh, just, just a little bit before <laughs> the time we were talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we couldn't get to the end of this without at least mentioning his name because <laughs> he, exactly. he's such an influential figure in the in the genre and in, in that kind of suspense film. Yep. So, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah any, thank you so any much for having word? me. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. If you want to kind of plug your podcast, Oscar Wilde, and tell us, tell, tell the listeners how they can find you online. Yeah. So um, I am a co-host of Oscar Wilde, which you can find us at 
Oscar Wilde podcast on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. My co-host is Sophia Simonello. And we talk about everything from movies to the Oscars to everything that's going on now and old films with the Oscars, best pictures. We've talked mm-hmm. about decades and years and kind of going on what, what you've done so far and where you're taking your podcasts. Mm-hmm. So lots of different ideas and um, just love for film. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for anyone interested in, in, you know, Oscar history and the Academy Awards, definitely worth a listen. I've been listening to, I've listened to three or four in the last couple of weeks. And you, you, yeah, you have great chemistry with your co host It's a, it's a fantastic Thank podcast. You. That's I, great. I recommend everyone check it out. Yeah. I like to hear that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Nick. And thank you all for listening. Uh, we'll uh, catch you next time on Film at 50. Have a good one.